Hey guys, James Sane. So today's video is about if your patient's coming to the cardiac cath lab and what does that mean for you and what does that mean for your patient? So this video is for the healthcare professional and that your patient's coming to the cath lab and so that you have a better understanding of what it means so that you can help explain the procedure, uh, one, to the patient and to the patient's family, and two, that you have a better understanding of what's going on in the cath lab. So a little bit about me, my background, I've been a nurse for about 30 plus years. I started out in intensive care, then moved to respiratory ICU, then worked CCU, uh, and then I went to a busy cardiac cath lab, uh, interventional lab, I worked there for a number of years. I've worked in industry, in, in uh, pharmaceutical sales. I've worked in the, in the device arena as a clinical specialist. And, and now I currently work uh, in an interventional cath lab. It's a combo lab. It's a cath lab and IR special procedures lab. I've also been an adjunct professor at Polk State College where I teach uh, pharmacology and uh, hemodynamics. So in preparing your patient to come to the cath lab, hopefully your hospital has some printed information that they can that you can give to the patient, uh, as well as a, some type of video uh, educational system, perhaps like the Get Well Network, so that you, your patients can watch and absorb things in their own way. So what does it mean if your patient's coming to the cath lab? So what I wanna focus on is a left heart catheterization versus a right heart catheterization versus PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. Now I'll come back to those terms in, in just a minute. Now, so your cath lab at your hospital or the hospital that you're going to, um, they may do a lot more than just that. So some cath labs are um, cardiac cath labs as well as uh, IR uh, combo labs where you do interventional radiology procedures. Um, some cath labs uh, often do peripheral interventions, both arterial interventions and uh, venous interventions. And those procedures are typically done by uh, either a cardiologist, an interventional radiologist, or a vascular surgeon. Uh, there's the whole electrophysiology component of cath labs where you do EP studies, uh, testing to see do people need a pacemaker, um, things like AFib ablation, VTAC ablation, and then there's the whole implant side that's done in EP or some cath labs do implants as well, uh, meaning you're getting pacemakers, defibrillators, uh, uh, by V devices, uh, cath lab holding areas. Uh, we'll often do um, the, the transesophageal echocardiograms, the cardioversions, and the tilt table testing. Actually, each of those topics could be a video um, by itself, but I want to focus on uh, right heart cath, left heart cath, and PCI. So what is a right heart catheterization? So first of all, know that this is a venous procedure. So when a patient has a right heart catheterization, it doesn't refer to access on which side of the body. It doesn't matter if you do right femoral, left femoral, right brachial, left brachial. All the veins lead back to either the inferior or the superior vena cava. The right heart cath has nothing to do with, with which side of the body is accessed. It's because we're going up to the right side of the heart into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonic valve, into the pulmonary artery and we're evaluating things like cardiac output, uh, evaluating things like uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, assessing for any atrial septal defects, ventricular septal defects, uh, looking at fluid status, overhydration, underhydration, also assessing the valves, the mitral, the, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, uh, not so much the aortic valve, that's on, the, that's a, on a left heart cath. Um, but that, in essence, is what a right heart catheterization is. If you work in intensive care, um, you, it's when you have a, uh, a pulmonary artery catheter and a Swan-Gans catheter insertion. That's part of what we do when we do a right heart cath. Now, the more common procedure is a left heart catheterization. And it, again, that has nothing to do with which side, the left or right side of the body we're accessing. So a left heart cath is an arterial procedure. So we're going to the left side of the heart and we're looking at the arteries on the heart, the left main and all of its branches and the right main artery and all of its branches, as well as looking at the left ventricle, how strong and well it functions as a muscle and evaluating the aortic valve. So again, it's an arterial procedure. It doesn't matter if you go into the left radio, the right radio, the right femoral, the left femoral, all the arteries, when you go retrograde, when you go backwards, they all, when you go up the aorta, they all lead to the aortic valve. 
which is where the, the left main and the left aortic cusp, the right main and the right aortic cusp. So when I talk to patients, unless they have a, a, a medical background, I try to talk in very uh, simple terms. They're getting a lot of information that can be overwhelming. I tell them for the left heart catheterization, the doctor wants to do a heart catheterization, and what that means is we want to look at the arteries on your heart. Blocked arteries can cause chest pain, or they can possibly cause a heart attack. And you're going to get one of three answers. One, you don't have any blockages. Number two might be you have some minor blockage or moderate blockage. It's not that bad that we need to do an intervention on, but we're going to treat it with medicine. Now, we also have to control the things that affect heart disease. And I tell the patient, this may not be applying to you, but it's smoking, it's diabetes, it's high blood pressure, it's cholesterol, it's exercise, it's weight. If you have some mild to moderate blockage and you don't take the medicines that the doctor prescribes, you don't control those things that you can control, like your blood pressure, your diabetes, your cholesterol, your weight, your exercise, then the blockages will just get worse as the weeks and months and years go by, and then you probably will have to have something fixed. So the third option that you might get is that you have blockage, it's 70% blocked or more in the coronary artery, and we need to do something to fix it. And we can fix it one of two ways. One is with balloons and stents, and if you need that, we'll do that here and now while you're in the cath lab. Or number two, you might need uh, open heart surgery. And then for the healthcare professional, that, that can scare ooh, open heart surgery. I want to assure you that the test is not difficult to go through. And I've given you everything from you have absolutely no problem to you need open heart bypass surgery and all the stuff in between. So we have to do the test to define your anatomy to find out is there a problem or not. All right, and so then back talking to the healthcare professional watching this video, we will also in the cath, on the left heart cath, we will evaluate the function of the left ventricle. So we'll put a catheter in there, we'll measure pressures, and this also talks about fluid status, overhydration, underhydration, um, and how well the ejection fraction is, which is also checked on the echo. And we evaluate the aortic valve for aortic regurg or insufficiency, uh, as well as aortic stenosis. Now the patient can have additional procedures that may continue on outside the cath lab, like an intraortic balloon pump insertion, an impella insertion, um, a temporary pacemaker, so things that you will have to manage uh, after the procedure. That's something that you might have to deal with as well. Preoperatively, you should have orders. I know it doesn't always happen, but you should have orders. You should have uh, an order for exactly what the consent should say. You should probably have a, a pre-procedure checklist um, of all the things that need to be done to get the patient ready for the cath lab. Your patient will most your patient will be NPO. Most physicians want at least four hours of being NPO, and the reason for that is the sedation can sometimes make the patient sick, and they're going to have nausea and vomiting. We want their stomach empty because they're laying on their back. We want to minimize the chance of aspirational pneumonia. That's the reason for being NPO. So you should have orders for which medications to be given, which medications are to be held. Now, it's not up to you and me to decide. Um, just as an FYI for cath lab, aspirin and the oral antiplatelets, the uh, Effie and Berlintoplavix, they're never held for a uh, heart cath. Matter of fact, the physicians would be upset probably if you didn't give it. To make the issue more confusing, if your patient's going to the cath lab for like an IR procedure, the aspirin and the oral antiplatelets are almost always held. So that adds to the confusion of the patient going to the cath lab because different things are done in the cath lab. But it's not up to me and it's not up to you as a nurse to decide what is going, what is going to be held. You have to have an order. The patients are on these medications for a reason and giving them and doing a procedure has its risks. Stopping the medication so you can do a procedure has its risks as well. So generally speaking, oral anticoagulants like Pradaxa Elica Zeralta are typically held. But I'm not telling you that you just stop that on your own, but I'm just telling you if you see that the patient's on Pradaxa Elica Zeralta and they're going for a procedure in the cath lab, we're going to poke a hole in your artery, that's probably a medication if it's still being given, you might want to make a phone call and say, hey, do we want this held? For example, Lovenox. Uh, if you work at a hospital where Lovenox is twice a day, Lovenox, because it has such a long half-life, 
that can get an elective uh, heart cath canceled. It will certainly get an IR procedure canceled. So sometimes you have to call. I know physicians should put their orders in, but it's helpful if you know what to expect so that you can um, troubleshoot. So some other things that you should be concerned about when, as it relates to um, uh, pre-cath orders, uh, if you see the patient has a contrast allergy. So if they have previous exposure to contrast, because that's, that's what we use in the cath lab and most uh, many uh, IR procedures, we're going to give contrast. And uh, also if the patient, physicians, there's, there's differing opinions if you have a shellfish allergy, because shellfish is iodine-based, contrast is iodine-based. So if people have a, a shellfish allergy, they might have an allergy to iodine. If you don't see pre-medication orders, solumedrol, benadryl, pepsid, sometimes solucortef instead of solumedrol, that might be a phone call that you're making. Hey, the patient has, especially if it's a severe allergy, um, to contrast. Every hospital, there's often an issue of, uh, of consent. So the physician, yes, the physician or the nurse practitioner that works for the physician should talk to the patient and get consent. But in the real world, it's, it's kind of up to you and me. Now, the physician should have talked to the patient and answered all the questions. So when you get consent, you're witnessing the signature. Obviously, if the patient has more questions, then they need to talk to the physician. But if all their questions have been answered and they need to sign consent, you need to get consent. Um, and now this raises the question, is the patient confused? So like people in the cath lab will call for the patient we don't know the patient. We've never laid eyes on the patients. Maybe we rounded on them an hour or two before to do some pre-teaching, some pre-rounding to lower their anxiety. But if the patient's confused, 30 minutes before the cath is supposed to start, that's not the time to start searching for a power of attorney or who the next person in the family is to get consent from. Be proactive. Get a consent on a confused patient from whoever the next person is that's going to sign the consent. If you want to be a rock star, if the patients had previous bypass surgery, we spend a lot of time in the cath lab, and that's a lot of contrast that's given to the patient searching for bypass grafts. Some surgeons put little suture rings around the bypass graft, making it easy to find, and most of them don't do that. And the patients, they don't ever, they often don't get the information correct. They'll say, I've had three bypasses. Well, they didn't, they only had two. Or they had two bypasses and one was a jump graft. You don't expect the patient to keep up and know all that, but we're hunting and hunting and hunting. And so it's a time waster and it's bad for the patient because they get contrast that they don't need. So the point being, if you know the patient had previous bypass surgery, get, get medical records from wherever they had their surgery from. You don't need a doctor's order to do that. The patient just has to sign con, uh, the medical records release and get the medical records the cath lab and the physicians will be so appreciative if you have a surgery uh, record. And, and so why is like the concept of too much contrast important? Well, contrast, uh, blood doesn't show up on x-ray, so the doctor injects contrast or IV dye while we take x-ray pictures so we can see what the inside of the arteries look like. And the kidneys get rid of the contrast. So too much contrast can cause acute kidney injury. That's another thing, if you see the patient has an elevated GFR, an elevated creatinine, or an elevated or low low creatinine clearance. Uh, the, typically, the way most people treat that is prehydration and posthydration. So, if you see somebody has a creatinine of 1.4, 1.5, um, then that might be a call and say, "Hey, would you like some um, prehydration for the patient?" If you don't have that as a pre-cath order. Um, you can't start that on your own. You need a physician's order, and you have to be very judicious with your congestive heart failure patients. That's a double-edged sword. That's a, that's, a, that's a fine line that you're walking of prehydration, post-hydration in a CHF patient. So the patient, they need functioning IV when they come to the cath lab. We prefer to have two IVs. And this is an left heart catheterization, especially if it turns into an intervention. Uh, if, if you work at an institution where it's gonna be a radial approach, then you need the IV not to be anywhere near the right wrist because there's going to be some type of band going on the wrist post-procedure, and the IV tubing, you know, you can't put a tight compression bandage around the right radial and have IV tubing or any part of the IV underneath it. 
and just like going to surgery, you know, we need to pay, we need their jewelry off, we need their clothes off, all, all their clothes off except for their gown, their nail polish needs to come off, we need to assess their, uh, their SAO2, we need to assess the color of their nail beds. Um, so jewelry off, clothes off. So you'll get report about blockages in certain arteries or stints put in certain arteries. So it's helpful if you understand there is a left main and a right main. Uh, nobody calls the right main, they call it the RCA. And there's a branch, there's a PDA branch, a posterior descending artery and a PLV, posterior LV branch uh, on the RCA. The left main branches into the LAD and branches off the LAD are diagonals. So you have diagonal one, diagonal two, diagonal three. Somebody can have only one diagonal branch, or they can have three. It's a normal variant. Uh, then there's a circumflex artery, and branches off the circumflex are obtuse marginals. Uh, so there's OM1, OM2, OM3. Again, somebody may have a circ and OM1, or they may have a circ and they have three OM branches. Um, there's also a normal variant. Instead of um, just an LAD and a circ, you may have an intermediate ramus. You have a third branch. Um, and so some people may call it the intermediate, some people may call it the ramus, they may call it the intermediate ramus. And so how you manage the access, access site post-procedure depends, is it an artery or vein? So vein, low risk of bleeding, artery, high risk of bleeding. And it's not whether the patient had an intervention or not, though that matters, it's, it's did the patient get anticoagulation or not? And the anticoagulation is typically heparin or angiomax. So if they had a PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, that's things like balloons, stents, atherectomy, rotoblader, laser, uh, clot sucking machines uh, to take the clots out. So it's not so much important in the cath lab. That's kind of getting off into the cath lab minutia about how the doctor fixes the blocked arteries. But did they have something fixed? And if they have something fixed, if you're inside working in a small blood vessel, putting pieces of metal in there, you have to have anticoagulation. Sometimes, so a diagnostic heart cath, you're not going to get this very minimal anticoagulation. You're not going to get anything significant. But there is, you can have lesions or blockage and go, well, we're not really sure if we need to fix it. And we may do IVIS, intravascular ultrasound, or we may do a pressure wire, IFR wire, FFR uh, wire, where you're measuring pressure gradients on each side of the blockage. So the IVIS and IFR, FFR, they require anticoagulation. So you can have a patient that just had a diagnostic heart cath, but because of IVIS, IFR, or FFR, they did get anticoagulation. So that is what determines how you manage um, your sheets. Uh, so you may have a femoral sheet that you have to pull, and that's a whole other story. So if you, need a, if you need a good video, I'll leave a link here. Uh, about doing an arterial sheath pull, femoral. Um, so if you've got anticoagulation, that will affect how long your bed rest is, that will affect how long if your she sheath's going to stay in. If the, t if the radial sheath's already been pulled, it's going to determine how long the TR bands. So if it's a diagnostic case, the TR band's typically on for one hour, and then you have a policy procedure for letting the air out. If it's an intervention or if you got anticoagulation, your TR band is probably going to stay on two hours and then your policy and procedure for letting air out. And so, you know, so what are the complications post-procedure? The number one complication is uh, access site bleeding. I mean, unless the patient has a retroperitoneal bleed, which that's a medical emergency, you need to get to CAT scan and surgery. Um, but bleeding from a radial site, bleeding from a femoral site, like you can have TR band on, and you can have 100 patients with the TR band, and you can take the TR band off, 97, 98 of them, and not really watch it very close, and they're going to be fine. But it's the one or two or three that you're not watching close, they start getting bleeding, and it's typically bleeding under the skin, swelling up, swelling up the arm. Same thing in the, in the femoral area. It's really up to you. So... Controlling the bleeding is up to you, and the way you control bleeding is you put pressure on the arteriotomy site, or if it's an artery just proximal to the arteriotomy. So if the patient is bleeding, the treatment is somebody, you, has to be holding pressure where the hole is in the artery. You have to make the bleeding stop. There's been so many times where people call and say, the patient, they're bleeding in their leg or their wrist, or it's swelling up. It's like, is anybody holding pressure while you're calling me? No, nobody's holding. And I have to run up there and hold pressure. It's like, some, it, 
if the if the access site bleeding is so bad that you have to call somebody and say, hey, we have a problem here, somebody needs to be holding pressure. I know it's time consuming, but the right amount of pressure at the right time can solve almost all problems and prevent them from becoming actual problems. So you have to learn how to manage bleeding. It's one of the biggest things post-procedure that you have to take responsibility for and learn how to do it. Also post-procedure, so the patient can have some pain. Uh, it may be expected, it may not be expected. Uh, you may be getting 12 leads. So if you work in the area with uh, calf patients, it's really helpful, one, that you know how to do a 12 lead, uh, two, that you know how to interpret a 12 lead. So I encourage you to take as many 12 lead classes. You can't just take one 12 lead class. So you're not going to get it all in, in one class. Uh, there, there's an old saying about what do people see when they look at a 12 lead? They see what they're looking for. And the unsaid portion is the 12 lead EKG reveals a lot. And to the uninitiated, there's a lot that people don't see that's right in front of their face. So take a lot of 12 lead classes. Uh, it's helpful. Uh, it, it's, if somebody's having chest pain, then you're looking for are they having ST segment elevation, ST segment depression. It's helpful for us when somebody's having a STEMI. Um, we know that an anterior, we, we can look at an EKG, the physician will look at an EKG and he already knows probably which artery, exactly which artery has to be fixed. And we go searching for that one first. So uh, the, take as many EKG classes as you can. I mean, and there are other things, you know, you can have infection, you can have pseudoaneurysm, you can have vasovagal when you're pulling a sheath. So there are other things that you need to learn when it comes to sheath pull but bleeding is the number one complication that you're going to be dealing with. So in closing, I'll leave you with this uh, caveat. The number one pre predictor of stent thrombosis is the patient's noncompliance with dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, which is aspirin and then one of the oral antiplatelets, which is uh, Plavix, Effiant, Berlinta. So it's incumbent upon you to teach the patient about their um, the, the importance of the dual antiplatelet therapy and that they should not stop that unless the cardiologist who put the stent in says stop it. Alright guys, thanks so much. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up. It would help my channel and if you found the information helpful or useful, consider subscribing to the channel and if you do, remember to turn on notifications so that you don't miss when the next video comes out. Alright guys, we'll see you in the next video.